Hello everyone and welcome to Tabor Talk. So I am going to play a clip in a minute uh, from 60 Minutes 1968, Episode 1. What was the topic of conversation? The first part of 60 Minutes, I had a thing on Nixon, but the second part, police brutality and bad cops. And, you know, we're, we, we're talking now about defunding the police. No, that's not the answer. More training, more money. But let me play this and I'll talk for a couple minutes afterwards. It's about 12 minutes long. It's not the greatest quality. Basically, I just held my phone up to my iPad here. And uh, uh, yeah, it just as a side note, I lost the, the company I used to use was called safefrom.net and they went out of business. So for the time being, for the, excuse me, for the time being, please uh, bear with the holding up of the phone. Watch Curtis. this. The American policeman in 1968 is out of joint with his time. He is the target for charges of brutality, mistreatment of minorities. He's regarded with fear by some, contempt by others. In turn, he complains of a public disrespect for law and order. Says that he's hamstrung in the performance of his duty by technicalities in the law. There can be little doubt that he is undertrained, underpaid for the job with which we've charged him. The top cop in the United States is Attorney General Ramsey Clark. He, too, has been damned by some, indeed by some law enforcement officers, as soft on crime, soft on law and order. He offered no concession to those who damn him when he said last week, of all violence, police violence in excess of authority is the most dangerous. Totally. For who will protect the public when the police violate the law? Mm -hmm. I asked Ramsey Clark about the American policeman. I think Dick Gregory has said that today's cop is yesterday's nigger. You understand that? Yes, I understand that. It's, um, you know, you've got to be able to recognize wisdom and truth where you find it. I find a lot of truth to that. I think, so. I think what he means is that um, the policeman today is a man who is put upon from every standpoint. Uh, he's not paid well. He's not trained well. He finds a little opportunity to improve himself. He lives a life that um, causes uh, very considerable risk to his uh, safety. His relationships with the community that he there serves have become so strained in so many parts of our cities that um, uh, he is living, working in a hostile environment. Well, he's living in a hostile environment because he is the white community or the outside communities, let's say, point of contact with that community. He's, he's out at the cutting edge. The people who live there will tell you that when the sun goes down, there ain't nobody here but us and the cops. The people are uh, using the policemen as scapegoats because there's nobody else. They feel that we're in their like the occupation screen. force. We have to control... And why the, the screen? The That's better. The car breakers, the uh, the robbers, the assaulters, and yet at the same time, That's not too bad, we right? have to protect those people that also live in the same area. It uh, can be hairy sometimes. You understand? I'm just holding up my so phone. About police so. brutality. I suppose it's a hard subject again for a top cop to talk about. How much of it is there? How much of the complaining about that? is valid i think the frequency of the cry police brutality uh, tends to obscure the real issues and the real issues are professionalization of police adequate pay for police and as we do these things then the use of excessive force and the attraction to the police department of people who are more likely than others to use excessive force will diminish if a third of your police department didn't finish junior high school yet they can arrest you or me or a PhD. Incredible, right? Then you have to wonder how much we really care about public safety and individual liberty. A lot of times you go out here and you you get a fight and you can't stand there and, and uh, say, well, I can't use too much force on it because he'll charge brutality and you have to use just as much uh, force as he uses on you. A young man coming out of the job today, and he has a second thought, then he's liable to be dead. 
all through my years, I have known men that have gone into police work, and unfortunately, I have known men who have left police work because they found, first, that they were unsupported within their departments frequently. They found that their families were suffering privations because of inadequate pay. They found that they had no respect in the communities that they worked. No, you needed some citizen to make a complaint against you. And maybe it's not a good complaint. Well, if he's got enough witnesses to say it's a good complaint, you can be able to judge. Well, we represent authority, and some people in the American society, I guess, just, is just opposed to authority. How does the Negro community look upon a Negro policeman? And a good illustration is, uh, <clears throat> is a story that uh, the police have told me on several occasions where so many of their fine young officers recruited from Negro areas never want their the people among whom they live, their neighbors, to know that they're in police work. They'll wear civilian regular clothes to the police station and they'll change in the locker down there and they'll try to stay out of the area they live in police work, not because they're in undercover police work at all. They're regular line duty men, but they're embarrassed about it. They're a little That's bit ashamed incredible. of it. Being a black officer, you know more, you know the people. You know, you know obviously, for better, and you know maybe how to uh, get along with them in a better respect than you would if you were, I guess, if you were a white officer. But uh, being in a uniform, you uh, uh, the people automatically. Uh, Present the uniform. I think that the community, and I'm talking about the Negro community, and that has just as much suspicion of the Negro officer as they do of the white officer. They sort of feel that he has sort of gotten out of the muck and has sort of gotten into the mainstream of society, and consequently he has joined the, well, the society that sort of controls our own destiny. Uh, but suppose you were the kid in the ghetto. And suppose from the time you were first sensitive enough to recognize things. You could see the policeman on the beat when numbers tickets were being sold. And you could see him standing looking the other way when narcotics peddlers were selling dope. And he must have known about it. It's a little hard under those circumstances to have respect. I see a lot of cops do a lot of things that's dishonest, you know, like uh, seeing them in the after hour joints, you know. I see them, uh, book is paying them off, you know. Uh, certain joints that. There are certain dudes that's out here, been out here all their lives peddling drugs. But yet, people the come on the street, maybe just start mm -hmm. peddling drugs. You know, it's the institution you that's the problem. The that you know, the street, and how the ones that yeah, they're bad cops. Uh, they get uh, so I'll talk afterwards. See, ever since I was nine, all the way up to now, they've been harassing me. You see what I mean? So I don't have no respect for no police. I don't dig it. If the police were trying to understand the people way the people feel, you know, and the people would, in turn, they already know what the police is for. See, but now it's up to the police to establish relationship, not the people. Please. We associate the problem with the ghetto because it's most intense there. The daily contact between police and <clears throat> the ghetto dweller is, is so much more frequent and so much more frictive than in other parts of the city that we fail to remember that the total bundle of attitudes between the entire community and the police are troublesome elsewhere. And we saw very clearly in Chicago <clears throat> the antagonisms that uh, exist and that come forth so readily. This is 1968. And so. A wide spectrum of generally young people since time immemorial it's an old story this is not new the many divisions that uh, we have in this country divisions between the rich and the poor and the young and the old and between the educated and the uneducated well i think the police are generally insecure about their own position in society yep and they feel that the young especially the educated young are exactly uh, wise and uh Smart Alex. They should have broke their heads. What is this uh, generation comment of a bunch of madmen and commies and everything else? See, it's the same old story. The the nothing new. Deplorable. See that older. It's the same thing. 
used to be that, that poli whatever a policeman said was the law. I remember when I was a boy, 14 years old, just watching a fire. I had my head split by not moving away as fast enough as a cop told me to. And I wind up with about 14 stitches in the head. These guys do waste and they get away with it. And I don't think that is right. When I was young, I got a shot in the can at the police. I went home and my old man beat the hell out of me because I got a, a hit by a cop. The kids, these are white middle class kids. They have everything that, these, that the cops probably want in life in terms of materialism. And this, and they, they just don't, I don't think they comprehend what these people are fighting for. To me, the, the middle class kids have reached, have reached a different plateau. They, they're going on to, to a better society, which is manifested in, in uh, humanism. They've reached the point where materialism is no, more, no longer important to them. I don't think police realize this. They're on, they're on a different plateau in society, I think. They, these, these are the things they're striving for, a home in the suburbs. Things which these kids have had already and passed on. What is the cop on the beat's view of society? It can tend to be pretty bleak. You know, a very large part of law enforcement uh, work goes into family disputes. Murder, that's the most serious crime in most of our personal judgments. Um, a third of them are within families. 75% are among people who know each other well. And the police are going into these situations all the time and they see this. It can give you an awfully pessimistic estimate of mankind. If you're spending 50 hours a week out on the streets, having to make arrests of young toughs, bringing people into the station house who've just been cut up with a knife or shot with a pistol, if everything you see tends to be violent and tends to be aggressive and, and uh, the people around you, you're always worried that something's going to hit you in the back or in the back of the head, uh, then that wears you, wears you pretty thin in time. And you have to wonder what it is about our society that, uh, that we care so little and, and why it is that courts seem to turn some of these people loose that you just arrested and, uh, and uh, has been a risk to you personally. You caught him. And you charged him. And then you feel like you've done it for nothing. That, uh, he's back out there in the street again. <clears throat> There's never been a time in our history when the police are as important to the American people as they are today. These next several years will determine whether we have time to rebuild our cities and rebuild ourselves to do the immense construction job that this country has to do. And the policeman is the chief key to the solution as to whether we will have this time. If he can maintain balance, if he can enforce the laws fairly without provocation, if he can effectively maintain social stability in the areas that he polices without excessiveness, without either overacting or underacting, then we will have this time. And if he fails, it is possible to see a division in this country caused by an escalation of riots and bloodshed um, that would create a division that would take generations to heal. One man was in a quiet corner during most of the time of the late unpleasantness in Chicago, watching the behavior of police and delegates and reporters on television. And it occurred to him that maybe the major quality a good policeman has is the same major quality a good reporter has, a certain detachment. Suppose yep. you have a chaotic situation and somebody personally repulsive to a policeman climbs a flagpole to replace the American flag with a Viet Cong flag. Your ideal policeman says, hmm, I believe that's a violation of Section 330-B. But as we noted in Chicago, that kind of detachment is hard for a policeman to achieve. And as also noted in Chicago, it's hard for reporters, too. Okay. I know how the cops feel. Oh, wait. Not being a cop, you can't possibly know how they feel. Not being me, how do you know whether I no, know it's a Sandy how Bruni? the cops feel or not? Not being me, how do you know whether I know how you know or not? Thank you. Thank you. So how awesome was that? How about that? 1968, the very first episode of the longest running television show ever, 60 Minutes. <laughs> oh, just incredible. So yeah, we have a huge problem. Uh, and we have to get it right this time. Uh, the George Floyd stuff has been going on since time 
immemorial. We need not defunding, more funding, better training. And, uh, well, it's not going to be easy, but we have our work cut out for us. Okay, God bless us. Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience, conscience, excuse me, Tabor Talk. Peace, love, and understanding.